there can be little doubt that calcium impacts the results of PCI. It can impair device delivery and crossing. It has been associated with incomplete stent apposition and stent under expansion. This is a powerful predictor of restenosis and stent thrombosis. The presence of coronary calcification increases the risk for adverse clinical events at one year. Intravascular lithotripsy applies the technology that has been used for over 30 years to treat kidney stones. Acoustic pressure waves are generated from emitters placed on the shaft of the balloon angioplasty catheter at one wave per second, each lasting a microsecond, transmitting 50 atmospheres of instantaneous pressure to the intimal, superficial and deep medial calcium. The balloon is inflated to four atmospheres, 10 impulses are given, the balloon is then inflated to a nominal pressure of six atmospheres. If full balloon inflation does not occur, the balloon is deflated, reperfusion occurs, and then the cycle is repeated. Eventually, full balloon inflation will be achieved at a six atmosphere pressure. The mechanism of action appears to be multiplane longitudinal calcium fracture. As you can see on the far right, there is calcium fracture expansion with stent deployment, which appears to be the mechanism for increased transmural compliance. The CAD3 study design is a prospective, multi-center, single-arm, global IDE study performed in four countries, the US, UK, Germany, and France. Patients with heavily calcified de novo coronary lesions were involved. This definition includes radio opacities on both sides of the vessel extending at least 15 millimetres in length by angiography or calcium angle at least 270 degrees by intravascular imaging. Reference vessel diameters had to be 2.5 to 4 millimetres. Stenosis severity had to be at least 50% and the lesion length had to be 40 millimetres or less. One roll in patient per site was allowed at 47 global sites. There were 47 roll in and 384 patients in the intention to treat population. The primary endpoint was assessed to 30 days and there was a key 100 patient OCT substudy. This study represents the pre specified one year analysis for Disrupt CAD3. Key one-year endpoints are shown and include MACE, target lesion failure and stent thrombosis. Subgroup analyses as well as the predictors for MACE and TVR at one year were also evaluated. These are the key clinical and angiographic eligibility criteria. They include being biomarker negative, having an ejection fraction greater than 25%, the lesion vessel criteria I've mentioned are shown. If the stenosis was at least 50% but less than 70%, there had to be objective evidence of myocardial ischemia, including an FFR less than or equal to 0.8, or a luminaria of less than or equal to 4 mm squared by intravascular imaging. The exclusion criteria included renal failure, defined as creatinine greater than 2.5, or dialysis, and myocardial infarction within 30 days. I want to acknowledge and thank the CAD3 study support infrastructure, including my co-PI, Dean Kariakis, the study chairman, Greg Stone. The CEC was chaired by Steve Marks, the DSMB was chaired by Etisham Mahmoud, and the angiographic core lab directed by Maria Alfonso and the OCT core lab directed by Akika Maihara. They did an incredible job. Most of all, I want to acknowledge and thank the top enrolling centres and the site principal investigators as shown here. This group did a remarkable job to bring this trial to completion in the face of COVID-19. Patients were enrolled from January 2019 to March 2020. A total of 431, which included 47 roll-in and 384 in the ITT population. One-year follow-up was completed in 97.1% of patients. These are the baseline clinical characteristics. The average age was 71. 90% of patients had either hypertension or hyperlipidemia. 
40% had diabetes, and 26% were defined as renal insufficiency using an EGFR of less than 60. Baseline angiographic characteristics are presented on the right and include a reference vessel diameter average of 3 mm, lesion length average of 26 mm, and a calcified segment length of 48 mm. 100% of these target lesions were classified as severe calcification. These are the procedural characteristics, which show that 50% of the targets were predilated with a 2 mm or less balloon. An average of approximately 69 IVL pulses were administered per case with a maximal IVL balloon inflation pressure of 6 atmospheres. Over 99% of stents were successfully delivered. The primary safety endpoint was freedom from 30-day MACE, which was achieved in 92.2% of patients. Procedural success was the primary effectiveness endpoint and was achieved in 92.4% of patients. Study success was achieved as both co-primary safety and effectiveness endpoints exceeded the pre-specified performance goals. Final instant diameter stenosis was 12% with a low rate of serious angiographic complications. The OCT substudy demonstrated an average MSA of 6.5 mm squared with an average stent expansion of 102% at the site of maximum calcification. Taken together, these results demonstrated the ability of IVL to safely and effectively facilitate stent implantation and full expansion in severely calcified lesions. This slide shows the Kaplan-Meier estimate for MACE, which occurred in 7.8% of patients at 30 days and 13.8% of patients at one year. The individual components of MACE are shown here. The MI rate was driven by the rate of non-Q-wave MI as there were no Q-wave MI events after 30 days. Key secondary endpoints included mortality, target lesion failure, and stent thrombosis. Target lesion failure was 11.9% at one year and was driven by the rate of target vessel MI. Definite or probable stent thrombosis occurred in 1.1% of patients, but only one event occurred after 30 days. Greater MACE at one year was noted in lesions more than 25 millimeters. MACE was similar in all other subgroups analyzed. MACE for both long lesions and bifurcation lesions was driven by non-Q-wave MI. This slide shows the similar rate of TVR at one year across all clinical and angiographic subgroups analysed. The independent predictors of MACE and TVR are shown here. By multivariable analysis, bifurcation lesion, prior MI and current or former smoker were significant predictors of MACE at one year, while prior MI was the only significant predictor of TVR at one year. So in conclusion, the current analysis of Disrupt CAD3 at one year represents the largest and longest clinical follow-up of patients treated with coronary IVL. There was a beneficial impact of coronary IVL calcium modification and facilitation of stent expansion to at least one year. The one-year rates of MACE and TVR were similar in most subgroups, with MACE in long lesions driven by the rate of periprocedural non-Q-wave MI events. Disrupt CAD3 will follow patients out to two years to determine if IVL can effectively reduce the longer-term incidence of adverse events.